find his practice was a, a, a much more pure, simple practice, which was to do with connecting to God in the woods, seeing that there's no real distinction or difference on a certain sense between nature and the divine, um, which is problematic for some people. So, you know, God is above nature. God is, transcends the physical universe. God isn't contained within the physical universe, yet he really believed that there, there, there is no barriers between God and the world. Even if there are barriers, that's the illusion that there's a barrier. But when you penetrate the essence of the physicality, is, there's no distinction. It all becomes one. To be a chassid, originally, it was like a revolution in in how to connect, how to serve God. Serving God wasn't just something of fear, it was more of love. It wasn't something just of Talmud. It was a, it was a, a revolution in simplicity and in, in that God wanted the heart more than the head and he wanted prayer more than, than study. He wanted simple deed more than kind of lofty speech. And that was how it began. The Baal Shem Tov was a populist. The Baal Shem Tov, he might have had an elite, small core group of people who he taught kind of the inner, the inner meaning of the Torah, but to the vast majority he spoke in parables and stories, and he lifted them up. He was a spirit of, of comfort and warmth and love. And um, then the movement kind of, like any other movement, it had to hold on to the core um, practice of Judaism, which has always been Torah study and halacha. So it's not that the Baal Shem Tov denigrated Torah study, but he denigrated Torah study as, a, as the way, as the only way, um, and, and, and the ego and the arrogance of the scholars who he felt were creating too big of a, uh, of a gap between the average person and, and Judaism. But he had this deep respect of all of humanity and as he, of all of nature. So there was, there was this uh, idea, and that's again one of the contradictions, is that you know, he definitely was very Jewish, so to speak. He was not advocating intermarriage or anything like that. On the other hand, he had this just tremendous, he was just so respectful and, 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 and in awe of all of God's creation, which is of all of humanity. So that's again one of the paradoxes of the Baal Shem Tov was somebody who had such a big heart and so much love for the whole universe, yet was very much finding his way within the context of Judaism, within the confines of how Judaism defines life and, and so on. One of the stories is just kind of, it, it uh, and, and this, this, uh, this is a story that, um, that Reb Shlomo would tell is the, the story of how there was a, after the Baal Shem Tov left, he kind of gave different of his Hasidim different jobs to do. And one of them, his job was to tell the stories of the Baal Shem Tov. He was around, he knew a lot of stories. And he heard there was this Italian patron who was fabulously wealthy who would give a gold coin for every Baal Shem Tov story that he heard. And uh, he was a poor preacher, this fellow, and he traveled to Italy to tell uh, hundreds of stories, hopefully. And when he gets to this man's house, he's ready to tell a story, and then all, all the stories just kind of evaporate. He doesn't remember anything. The man's like a little bit depressed. He says, you'll, you'll come back. He puts him in the guest house. Tomorrow, you'll say, and this goes on for a few days. It's the Shabbat. It's Friday night. Everybody's gathered. He doesn't remember any stories. Saturday, the same thing. And finally, he leaves on Sunday with no stories. Then he remembers, as he's leaving, he remembers one story. And the story is, he says, there was a, um, there was a city in which they were expecting a riot against the Jewish community. They used to have blood libels and all these kind of certain times. The Jews were fearful for their lives in 
Eastern Europe, there are many anti-Semitic communities that they had to be very wary of. So in this instance, there was a preacher, there was a, there was a priest who was known to be full of hatred to the Jews. Uh, and he would preach around a certain holiday and he would incite a riot and people would go and cause harm to the Jewish community, to the property and to the people. So it was into one of these situations where the Baal Shem Tov kind of just comes into town and goes right into the house opposite the square in which all of these people are gathered, these peasants are gathered, and the, and the preacher is almost ready to preach, and who knows what will happen afterwards. The Baal Shem Tov uh, tells me, the storyteller says, go through the square, get the preacher, and bring him here. Tell him the Baal Shem Tov wants to see him. He's like, I can't go, they'll kill me. The Baal Shem Tov says, just go. So he goes with pure faith, and nobody stops him. He comes up to the Baal Shem Tov, to the preacher, this is the, the, the Baal Shem Tov would like to see you. So um, initially he doesn't want to go. He says, I'll come after I give my talk. I can't go right now. Then this goes back and forth. He's, he's telling me he has to come now. He, 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 he comes with him. He leaves the, the podium or where that area where he would be speaking from. And he comes and he goes into the room with the Baal Shem Tov. And he locks himself into a private room. And he comes out a few hours later. His eyes are wet with tears. And then we don't know, nothing happens. There's no program, obviously, this guy. We don't know exactly what happens to him. Uh, he, he goes off and, and uh, something very deep happened there. So the Italian patron says, I'll tell you the rest of the story. He says, I was that preacher. I was born a Jew and I became a, I converted out and because a lot of times I wanted to show how I'm not one of them so I started saying anti-Semitic things and unfortunately I caused a lot of harm and uh, I started having dreams that my father came to me and said you better, you know, you better, the Baal Shem Tov is coming, you better listen to him and then when, the Baal, when you sent for me I came and then the Baal Shem Tov talked to me, I realized the error of my ways. But I was pained that I had caused damage. I had hurt people, I had incited people, and I didn't know if I'd ever be forgiven. And one of the hard things is when you make a mistake, you don't know whether there's ever a way to fix it. And I asked the Baal Shem Tov, when will I know? Baal Shem Tov gave me a, a, a many things that I should do to kind of reach atonement for, for, the, for the bad things I had done. And I asked the Baal Shem Tov, when will I know that I've done my work? And he said, when somebody comes and tells you this story, he's like, I've been waiting for you for many years. That's why I give out a gold coin for every Baal Shem Tov story. And I, and I love that story. I have a hundred stories that I love, but I love that story because it's got like how the Baal Shem Tov was fearless, how he could bring somebody back no matter how far away they had gone and, and the damage they had caused. And he could give that person hope. He could give that person. And how the Baal Shem Tov continues to work in the next generation and hopefully even in this generation, that his influence, his, his impact is still being there. So don't give up. One of his most powerful teachings is to love the words, just like a, a man and a woman, uh, when they're passionate, they're, they're cleaving to each other, they're in an embrace, they're, they're connected, they become one. The Baal Shem Tov believed that when we prayed, we could enter into this state of, this, of unity, kind of an intimacy with God, but the medium of that intimacy were the words of the prayer. So it's like perhaps when a, a person says the name of, of, of somebody they love with passion. They feel like that name, the word of that name and the way it sounds, the way it's heard is like a very intimate bond. Well, that's the words of prayer.